Hello, everyone. Thank you for taking the time to join us today for our webinar, Extending the Candidate Experience from Shoulder Tap to First Day. My name is Nina. I'm a member of the marketing team over at Glassdoor, and I will be your moderator for the day. So a couple of housekeeping tips for attendees before we get started. You can connect to audio using your computer's microphone and speakers, or you may select use telephone after joining the webinar. All lines will be muted to avoid background noise, but you can ask questions at any time by typing them into the question pane you see on your right hand side. To be mindful of everybody's time, we will save all Q&A to the end of the presentation, but please feel free to slot your questions in there whenever you have them. Now I'd like to introduce our amazing speakers for the day. First, we're joined by Edward Diaz, who is the Director of Recruitment Intelligence and Innovation at L'Oreal. We have Lisa Holden, who is the Employer Communications Manager at Glassdoor. And we are also joined by David Pompelli, who is the Director of Talent Solutions at Aviture. So David, I will pass it off to you to let you take it away for us. Thank you so much, Nina. First of all, let me just say I'm super excited to be a panelist today with Edward and Lisa. Um, as Nina mentioned, we're going to be talking about candidate experience, but we're going to talk about it from a little bit different perspective. Um, candidate experience is certainly not a new topic, and we know there's a great deal of conversation and chatter about it these days. And I'm also certain that all of our participants today really do understand the importance of providing a good candidate experience. However, when thinking of a good experience, we find oftentimes that the conversation, and more importantly, the actions to improve it, tend to center around the actual application and interviewing process. And while these are really, really important, uh, they're only a piece of the candidate's perspective. The reality is, is that every touch point between the candidate and your organization has an impact on that candidate. And this is a really important concept because I think we could all agree that skilled professionals are in really high demand and they have a lot of options. That means you can have a great application process but fail to convert talent with a poor offer process. We know that young professionals are changing jobs way more frequently these days, whether they're in search of more opportunities, work-life balance, uh, and or cultural fit. And you can have a great process to attract these young professionals, but what are your chances of retaining them if they have a disconnected experience on their first day on the job? So today we're going to focus on six key areas of the hiring process in what we say from shoulder tap to first day. And we're going to highlight what candidates want through each stage, and we're going to share key perspectives from Edward Diaz on how L'Oreal one of the world's largest consumer brands is overcoming common candidate experience challenges and delivering a good candidate experience to more than 1.5 million applicants per year. The candidate experience is not just one thing or one particular area, but it's made up of every single interaction a candidate has with your organization. At Aviture, we look at each one of these touch points, not only from the view of the candidate, but also from the perspective of recruiters, hiring managers, and business leadership personnel. You cannot achieve a world-class candidate experience if you do not enable all stakeholders to play their part. And this is where Aviture really comes to life. And I look forward to everybody getting to see how L'Oreal is putting candidate experience into practice with Aviture. But before we get into that, Lisa, how does Glassdoor look at the candidate experience? Sure, thank you, David, and thank you so much for having me today. Um, so let's start by walking through a typical candidate decision-making process. At the top of the funnel, you have awareness, which is where you attract and engage candidates, kind of for the first time. And this is where the majority of employers like you invest in channels like LinkedIn, Indeed, Glassdoor, staffing firms, et cetera. And once a candidate is made aware of your job, the next question they ask is, do I want to work for that employer? And this is where Glassdoor's unique business value starts um, for the employer. Uh, it's, it's very valuable for the candidate as they make their way through this journey, but when you're the employer, this is an opportunity for you to showcase your brand and who you are. So we influence the candidate at every step as they consider you as their employer of choice through infusing employee reviews, interviews, salaries, benefits, and ratings with their unique employer brand so that the candidate can make smarter and more informed decisions. 
So let's take a look at the overall impact of candidate experience on your business and brand. So if you look at the L'Oreal brand impact, before we talk about the numbers, perhaps, Edward, you could tell us a bit about the importance of brand reputation and why L'Oreal places such a heavy focus on it. Yes, of course, Lisa. So globally, as David mentioned, L'Oreal receives over 1.5 million applicants per year, um, which is incredible. And in the U.S., we receive about a quarter of that amount compared to the rest of the world. Uh, but interestingly, here in North America, our brand doesn't have that same impact that, that it does elsewhere in the world, and that can be a challenge. So we have to do more outreach. L'Oreal is a a well-known French brand. However, here in the U.S., it's perceived as a non-U.S. brand, and also some only think of L'Oreal Paris, which is actually just one of our brands, and not and most aren't aware of our full brand portfolio. So it feels and appears differently here in the U.S. than it does elsewhere in the world. Unlike France, we also don't have a direct brand uh, branding team. So as a recruitment team, we must also be more active in employer branding. We do lots of outreach, just letting people know who we are and why we're such a great place to work. So for example, as you can see, we recently were voted one of the top 100 diverse companies in the U.S. And not many people know that. So that's an opportunity for us to let people know we care greatly about gender and ethnic diversity, and our workforce reflects that. We pride ourselves in our diversity as we know that different points of view can be powerful in creating inclusive products. Um, so L'Oreal here in the U.S. attracts also uh, tends to attract more women than men. Again, this is down to the perceptions around the brands and beauty industry. So we continually have to showcase the different opportunities and work hard to change those perceptions. That makes a lot of sense. Um, <laughs> in, in the review-centric world that we're living in today, transparency like that is not only expected uh, by, by job candidates, but it's critical. And with transparency comes a tremendous responsibility and an enormous opportunity. So sort of if you think about transparency as the new normal, it means that HR has the responsibility to face the tough questions and take a strategic seat in the organization to be able to answer those kind of head on. And when you're thinking about your employer brand, you're thinking about your reputation. And as we know, if you don't define your reputation, someone else will. Um, it's, it's your reputation, your culture, mission and values, and your people. And uh, if, if you're not taking control of that message, people are already having the conversation about it. So what is an employer brand? Developing an effective employer brand is the foundation of an effective recruitment strategy. And I think all of us can agree that with a powerful reputation comes quality candidates. That people want to work for companies that are known for being great. And with the rise of social media, your message is out there whether you want it to be or not, because there are more voices involved in it. And, and I'm not saying to ignore the messages that, that are out there already. Those are a really critical part of this. Um, part of your employer brand is about the sentiment of potential applicants, current applicants, uh, and current and former employees as well. Uh, so the second piece of your reputation is all about culture. According to the 2016 Human Capital Trends Report by Josh Burson, culture has become one of the most important business topics of 2016. Culture is huge, guys. We can all agree on that. Uh, CEOs and HR leaders now recognize that culture drives people's behavior, innovation, and customer service. And a staggering 82% of leaders believe company culture gives them a competitive advantage. And this is also from that Deloitte Human Capital Trends study. However, Despite the importance of culture, 87% of organizations cite culture and engagement as one of their top challenges, also from the same study. And that's why it's so important to make it a priority to define your culture, define your values, which can really dictate your culture. So I want to give you an example. At Glassdoor, we have what we like to call a build-your-own-desk culture. And we've defined codes of engagement around this statement. So it's not just that we put the statement out there and let people think what they will. Um, we, we have a, a list of qualities that we are and a list of qualities that we are not. For instance, we are humble. We are not arrogant. We are scrappy. We are not lazy. And we have these signs posted around our office, and it helps everyone keep our culture front of mind. 
our culture and our values front of mind. It helps guide how we interact with each other, go about our work, and, and how we talk to each other. We have a shared language for talking to each other about our culture. And, and all this being said, you know, you don't need to be Google or a fancy tech company to have a great culture. Um, chances are your company already has a lot of this stuff. It already has a culture. It's a living, breathing thing uh, that's unique and special all on its own. So it's just about identifying what's already working for your organization. Uh, the next bit of this is about mission and values. And your reputation is also defined by your mission and values, and these should empower your employees. So not only job seekers looking, but also the people within your organization. Uh, not to mention potential investors and customers who are all looking at you um, and determining whether or not they want to invest or do business with you. Um, so it's critical to have a mission statement that your employees stand behind, believe in, know and understand. And so the more you reiterate that, the better. Uh, finally, your employer brand is, is your people. Uh, your reputation is comprised of your people and what they say about you. They're your biggest brand asset uh, and the most powerful voice in your arsenal. Uh, and this is because employees rank among the most trusted influencers when communicating about their company's engagement and integrity. And this is from the Edelman Trust Barometer of 2015. And in fact, Employees are three times more credible than the CEO when talking about working conditions, also from Edelman Trust Barometer. So when employees share content, it receives five to ten times the amplification rate than when a brand shares content uh, because people feel like it's more authentic. So it's, it's really imperative to let your people showcase your brand. And now that we've covered kind of the brand basics, David, I'd love for you to walk us through attracting and engaging candidates. David, are you, are you still there or did we lose you? My mistake. Sorry about that. Thank you, Lisa. Uh, sorry, I was on mute. The attract and engage uh, phase is really the, the first the first step in the process. Um, and so we want to ask ourselves, you know, well, how do we start creating a good candidate experience, you know, at this point? And if you think about it, it's really the first step of the candidate search. They could be searching for an internship, a job, or they could just be seeing what is out there. Um, this would usually probably be through your career site. It could be through a talent community, or it could even be through Glassdoor. Um, you want to be able to provide clear information about company values, employee testimonials, and reasons why people want to work and stay at your company. In fact, surprisingly, the research showed that these are more important to candidates than actual hard facts around financial and services information. From your perch at Glassdoor, wouldn't you agree, Lisa? <laughs> you know what? I would. And that is astounding because I personally think that I, I would like to think I was more interested in financial services information, but uh, as it turns out, People want to know what it's like to work at a company more than they care about that stuff. And perhaps they're just browsing, uh, and a good place to start looking is, of course, Glassdoor. <laughs> and 89% of Glassdoor users are either actively looking for jobs or would consider better opportunities. So everyone's always looking, and they have their um, ear to the ground, as, as we say. Um, I want to talk about passive and active candidates. So the start of every successful hire is getting the attention of a candidate in the first place. And that starts before we ever truly know who the candidate is. We're at the top of the funnel and trying to expand the reach of our talent acquisition efforts and employer brand as far as possible. So any channel can lead to that coveted first touch point, that first impression that a candidate gets to your company. And we need to measure how this happens. So there are typically two types of candidates. We know this, right? The passive candidate and the active. And so for passive candidates, They'll become aware of you through the channels they use every day, whether it's a consumer, a potential buyer of your product or service, um, advertising, both from a marketing or recruiting perspective, conversations with their connections online and offline in their daily web, web browsing. It's more, it's more of a um, they happen upon you kind of experience. And so for those actively looking for a job, they're in a completely different seat. They're actively using channels like job search engines, job boards. Google searches to find potential job opportunities that are open today. And they may also be actively connecting with their, with their own networks to receive referrals for potential positions. 
And so in either case, the candidate has come across your organization as a potential employer, and if successful, their interest is piqued enough for them to consider researching your organization more deeply. Yeah, Lisa. Uh, that's a really good point, Lisa. And I think a lot of organizations would probably agree that whether they're passive or not, candidates need to feel inspired. They need to feel motivated and apply to your company, and brand has a big part of that. Edward, you mentioned earlier that you don't necessarily enjoy the same brand affinity in the U.S. that the rest of the world benefits from. How in North America are you dealing with this? How are you attracting and engaging with potential candidates? I think we still have Edward. Sorry, were you not able to hear me? <laughs> I guess I was <laughs> muted as well. Um, so sorry about that. But yes, David. Um, so what we do is we target uh, specific audiences in a number of ways. The first step, for example, is our career site. Um, as we saw in the bar chart that you presented earlier, um, the career site should clearly not only focus on job postings anymore, uh, we took this into account at L'Oreal, and as you can see on our career site, visitors can learn more about how it feels to work for L'Oreal and get career advice as to who we are looking for um, in that particular section, as well as find more information about diversity, our benefits, and all the possible job functions, and our locations. As you can see, we present a lot of con content for candidates to explore and learn more about L'Oreal and what it's like to work here. And so that's basically the uh, career site. What we also do um, is we create landing pages specific to different audiences, making it easy for potential candidates to register their interest with us and associate themselves to specific talent pools. As you can see on this particular landing page, we have branded the header to reflect to the campus we are visiting uh, to provide that level of personalization. We've also included video content so that candidates can get a better understanding of L'Oreal, and we try to keep the questions to a minimum so that candidates can quickly share information with us, with us without it being a lengthy process. So another thing that we also do is that we also regularly combine text messaging and branded URLs in combination with these landing pages. So for example, let's say we're visiting a new city or campus, our recruiters are able to create a landing page themselves in a matter, matter of minutes using the Avatar landing page uh, builder to help publicize the events, and we drive traffic to the page through our text codes or we brand URLs which can be shared across social media and sometimes directly with campus career service centers. Um, on site, we can just ask attending and candidates who had not yet signed up, as you can see on this, by this text, um, through the landing pages. We've asked them to text the word L'Oreal to a particular number, and they will receive a link to the, to the landing page and can quickly fill out the form on their mobile devices while they're waiting for the event or presentation to start. This allows us that flexibility of receiving this information before, after, and during the event, and provides multiple paths to get to the landing pages with the ease of use and candidate experience being top of mind. So another thing uh, we do tend to do, uh, like I mentioned earlier, we have, have to make more of a concerted effort in the US. Uh, so what we do is we reach out to candidates to share our stories and much more. L'Oreal USA uh, recently, for example, launched the Life Work campaign focusing on the lives of 12 employees. Uh, what we wanted to do was demonstrate that it's possible to have a good work-life balance here and that it's also possible to live your life through work. Uh, we selected these 12 employees to showcase their duality and photograph them as part of this campaign. Um, I was one of them, as you can see, that's me. Um, so I'm not only the director of recruitment, intelligence and innovation, but I'm also a performer. Um, we also have a DJ who works in finance and a visual artist who works as a scient scientist in one of our labs. So we wanted to showcase that life and work can coexist together. We then shared these photos and stories across our social media channels, and honestly, the campaign has been excellent. 
And sometimes we also have to think outside of the box. Here in the U.S., most of our applicants are women, as I've mentioned before, um, as it's one of our branding challenges here in the U.S. So in order to attract more men to apply, we leveraged uh, SoundCloud. So the SoundCloud audience is made mostly of men. So what we've done is we've met with several business leads and interviewed them discussing anything from what it's like to work here at L'Oreal to innovation, strategy, culture, career paths, and the professional journeys of our employees. Um, and then what we do is we upload these files um, and podcasts to the channel and it seems to resonate well, and we can share these as well. Edward, I think what you're doing is so interesting because you are you are thinking of candidates as consumers, and the age of employer branding really calls for that. Um, the process of recruiting begins with finding and attracting candidates right, to your brand, and from there engaging them with information that resonates with them. And that's what you're doing so beautifully um, to, to kind of inch them along the process of considering your company as an employer. And from there, nurturing them to apply when it's appropriate. Um, and, and that's so important to today's job seeker. Um, today's job search process is rarely so straightforward as a candidate deciding to look for a job, screening a bunch of ads, sending in a resume, interviewing, and getting hired. You know, the candidate journey today is much less linear. And so crossing the online and offline environments with multiple touch points along the way, and including your website, your career site, blogs, social, events, all of that uh, combined with one-on-one -on -one interactions is, is really the key to success. So it's important to understand the candidate journey from attraction to application and what factors candidates are looking at when they're deciding whether or not to apply at that cru crucial decision point. You know, it makes sense that source of application comes mainly from a job board or career site. Um, but what attracted and influenced quality candidates to get there, that's harder to measure. Not every candidate is ready to apply, but you can nurture them with your brand and employee stories and position your employee value prop or your EVP to them over time. We know that 69% of active job seekers are likely to apply to a job if the employer actively manages its employer brand. Uh, and what I mean by that is things like responding to reviews, updating its last store profile, sharing updates on the culture and the work environment. Um, and that's a really key, uh, huge stat. It means that if you're engaged, job seekers notice and they care. And so, for instance, think about how your recruiting events allow candidate leads uh, to talk directly with hiring managers, or how social media might encourage leads to ask a question, or how content marketing and SEO drive leads to your talent targeted landing pages. You know, these efforts might not have a link to apply, but they do influence a candidate to consider applying, which is equally important. Um, so now, I'd like to transition and have us talk a bit about the candidate experience through application. And David, I'll hand it back to you. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. So improving the application process has been a pretty hot topic the last, I would say, at least few years. And, and you know, interestingly enough, though, despite the focus, it's still a real weak point within the hiring process. We've learned that up to 80% of candidates are typically dropping off. Lisa, what are you guys seeing around this in terms of particular trends or thoughts? I would imagine at Glassdoor you really get the opportunity to understand what candidates want during this stage of the journey. Definitely. <laughs> um, and it's really clear that if you don't have a mobile optimized site, you're missing out on applicants. Uh, we know that 45% of job seekers, 45%, that's half basically, say they use their mobile device specifically to search for jobs at least once a day. Wow, that's a number. <laughs> I, guess <it's> not, <laughs> I guess it's not that surprising anymore, though. Um, you know, I think if an organization really wants to compete for talent, they have to be able to demonstrate that they're forward thinking, that they're on the cutting edge of technology. Obviously, that's going to start in terms of look and feel with the application process. But it really goes beyond just being easy and simple or even mobile necessarily, but it needs to be transparent. And it also really needs to be relevant to the candidate. Similar to when you're processing your online order at Macy's, for example, you want to know how many steps are left in the process, when is my order confirmed, etc. Candidates would expect the exact same user friendliness while applying to a job. They expect to receive 
job specific content, job specific questions, and that is so that they can showcase their skills, not just general screen, uh, screening questions. They expect a simple and a straightforward and fast application experience that is accessible via mobile. And it is also important to customize the application process for each of your target audiences as it can really enhance your screening process, improve the experience for the candidate. Edward, I know this is something that you do at L'Oreal. Can you tell us a little bit more about how you guys ensure that you're providing an easy, straightforward application process to your more than 1.5 million applicants per year? Sure, David. So, of course, managing such huge numbers of applicants is a challenge. So first, what we do is make it super simple for candidates to apply for a job and prov not provide a number of options for them to submit to their CV. As you can see, you can Dropbox or you know, attach your Google Drive, a resume, or even upload a file. Um, this is extremely useful because as many candidates browse jobs from their mobile, as Lisa mentioned earlier, we can easily start the application process on the phone and then have them log in at a later stage to add further information and details if necessary. So also another thing that we do is that through our global career site we provide information in nine different languages and also customize the application process to reflect the different legal requirements in each region. So for example, gender, age, and ethnicity are questions which can be asked in some European countries but should not be asked in the U.S. for legal reasons. Also, um, in taking a look at the Body Shop website, um, depending on the type of job a candidate is applying for, we wanted to provide a very customized and relevant experience. So as you can see, applicants can choose how to proceed based on their interest in a retail job versus a home office position. So let's have a glance at what the retail application looks like. So if we go ahead and apply or go into the retail location um, and then apply to the uh, first one, the Christmas temporary position, you'll see um, that it this is the job description page. Uh, candidates can see very relevant information such as the store location since distance to work is extra important for retail candidates and also see a video about how it is to work at the body shop. So depending on the job that the candidate is applying for, what we also do is we use different types of screening and follow-up questions re relevant to that sector. So rather than asking generic questions, the candidate has the opportunity to answer a relevant question that's specific to their industry sector and skill set. The questions, for, for example, we ask the retail candidate are very different from the questions we ask to someone working in our laboratories. In this slide, you can see that we ask the candidate, um, we ask if the candidate has a driver's license and their preferred hours of working. These are aspects that could be important to know for a retail position, but not so much for our corporate roles. So once the candidate submits their application, the key is about communicating with them. As long as all of our recruiters take ownership of the work within the system the way that it was intended, we touch upon every single resume. And that's, as mentioned earlier, uh, 1.5 million of them. So. What that means is that while we may not have the chance to review every resume and assess for the role, everyone receives communication from L'Oreal at some point. Generally, it would be in any one of three situations. So first, if we've reviewed the resume and begun direct communication with the candidate for consideration. Uh, secondly, if we reviewed the resume and assessed that they're not a fit for that particular opportunity. And then third, if we had not yet had a chance to review the resume, it's a position maybe we've identified a finalist um, and it's we're about to close the position, but they would receive a notification that the position has been filled. So this level of personalization and customization across each brand and sector has also enabled us to improve our website rankings. So each year, Potential Park surveys thousands of candidates on career sites and overall re online recruitment experience. And this year, we were ranked 24th out of 129 U.S. companies. 
that improved our position by 25 places. So this just shows that we're really improving the experience for our candidates. Since we've been using Aperture ATS globally, we have been able to massively improve our communication rate with candidates during and following their application. Uh, before, over a million people worldwide would never get contacted. Um, but with this smart automation and flexible processes, we've been able to change that, and that's been a huge achievement. I mean, Edward, it's incredible to see what you're achieving at L'Oreal. I mean, it, it essentially, it really comes down to differentiating your company by giving candidates that smooth experience. And to be able to nurture them at this level is, is really astounding. Um, the candidates want to easily apply to positions. Like, it's that simple. You know, they don't want to go through a lengthy process. To give them exactly what they need to get through it is, is perfect. You know, we see this all the time. The longer the apply process is, the more likely a candidate is to not complete their application. And then you lose out on someone. You know, so like we saw L'Oreal doing, your employer brand has to be consistent across all channels. And, you know, you need to make a focus um, to highlight this. Your brand, this is a great quote from Jeff Bezos, the CEO of Amazon, by the way. Uh, he says, your brand is what people say about you when you're not in the room. And that's exactly right. It's your reputation. They're one and the same. So if you think about that, there's a, there's a lot of weight behind it. Um, it's exactly why your brand is so critical and why it's so important to define it, highlight it, and keep it consistent across channels. You know, this is how you're selling your organization to candidates. And, you know, keep in mind there's a shift to mobile. You need to be involved on the mobile platform. And with more candidates researching on their mobile devices, the exponential reach only goes up. Um, so if we go to the next slide, I'd like to move on um, to, to the experience through the interview and then feedback. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. So at this stage, you know, I would say from a company's perspective, this is really where candidate experience should be ramping up rather than tailing off. Um, companies at this stage are really needing to work hard to ensure that the ideal candidate wants to continue with the process. Perhaps you've had a really good interview with the candidate and how the organization handles the next steps is really critical when forming a good impression. But it's shocking. 60% of candidates never hear back after an interview. And as you can imagine, this leaves a pretty negative impression about your company, uh, which they can share with their friends, their family, and on social media. So, and, and also the research is telling us that 96% of candidates just simply indicated that they want to receive personal quality feedback regarding their skills and the overall impression that they left. Lisa, what are you guys seeing at, uh, at Glassdoor around this? I mean, you're, you're absolutely right. We hear this all the time. 96% of candidates say they want personal feedback. Of course. Of course they do. Um, I'm surprised. What are those 4% talking about? <laughs> you know? um, and, and it's clear when you read the reviews from candidates online on Glassdoor, um, Unfortunately, we can't participate and learn from every interview, but the data can tell us what's going well and what can be improved directly from our candidates. Um, and so if you go on Glassdoor, you can actually pull data on your company's individual interview process and see what candidates have said about it. And um, once you understand your own candidate experience, then you can evaluate uh, how you compare to your competitors. All of this data is public, so take a look at what your competitors are doing and see how you rank against them. Um, and when candidates get into the job seeking mentality, you know, efficient candidates are applying to multiple positions. It's not just yours. Uh, so, you know, what are those candidates saying and, and how do you stack up? Look at the positive and negative and, and really compare those. Um, Edward, I know that L'Oreal places a lot of emphasis on supporting their candidates through the interview process. Can you give us a little bit of insight into this? Sure. Um, so, um, you know, when we're talking about directing feedback or providing direct feedback, we don't necessarily do that as to why they're not a fit from initial apply, but we do like to support the candidates prior to each interview. So before the first interview, as you can see, this is um, an example of one of the email templates that we send. We want to be sure that the candidates stay in touch with our recruiters. 
and make sure that those lines of communication are open and easy. If a candidate gets moved to the second stage of interviews with the hiring manager, this is the type of a letter that we would send over to them or email that we send over to them. Um, and it would give you more information about what to expect, time, dress code, location, and driving directions if necessary. In some instances, candidates are asked to prepare a 15-minute presentation for a panel interview, uh, what we call our assessment center. So before this interview takes place, our recruiters send out helpful tips and information on how to build a presentation, what to talk about, and what to expect. Ultimately, we want our candidates to feel comfortable and prepared. And this is a critical step in that process. Wow, that's, uh, that's fascinating, Edward. I, I love that you guys do that to really kind of help your candidates be the best that they can be. Um, you had mentioned just a second ago that you don't necessarily give direct feedback to candidates initially, but I do know that you give them the option to provide feedback to L'Oreal on the interview process. Is that right? Yes, that's right. Yeah, that's right. So we'd like to provide the option for candidates to provide feedback about their application process and experience. Um, after submitting their application, they can access the link to a survey, and from there, they can tell us how they felt about the process and provide us you know, advice on where we can improve, uh, which also helps us enhance the entire experience. So as you can see, it's very quick, short, six questions. Edward, this is so helpful and insightful. I mean, I think a lot of companies feel over, pretty overwhelmed at this stage, so it's fascinating to see this level of transparency into what you guys are doing. Um, I want to shift us a little bit to talk about uh, offer management and dispositioning. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. So um, offer management and dispositioning maybe not even traditionally thought of as key candidate experience opportunities, but actually it's probably one of the most important moments for an organization. Think about it. You've spent a ton of time and money whining and dining candidates. You've made it to the offer stage and you're at that all important moment, whether they're going to accept your offer or not. Every single touch point up until this point has had an influence on the candidate's decision. And as Lisa mentioned earlier, it's highly probable that some of your best candidates have multiple offers. So you need to be in a situation where not only have you made a good impression, but you also need to be able to make an offer uh, quickly. And you need to be able to respond to questions. You might possibly have to negotiate uh, and do all of this in a timely manner. And if not, then your competition may beat you to it. And sadly, with every offer, there is a disposition. And in fact, there's probably many more dispositions than the number you're actually hiring. L'Oreal is a great example of this. You guys have over 1.5 million applicants a year, which I'm sure you don't hire all of them. How do you handle dispositioning on such a large scale, Edward? So, so David, um, over at L'Oreal, we have a, a few ways that we disposition. With so many candidates, uh, we try to educate candidates before they apply so they can decide whether or not they feel they are a fit. Uh, for L'Oreal. Um, like for example, we try to be as transparent as possible when it comes to compensation from the get-go. That can often naturally disposition a certain number of candidates as they may feel their current experience is not sufficient for a certain level of compensation or vice versa. Um, we also embed some knockout questions, for instance, during the um, application stages. As I mentioned before, this helps us identify candidates that meet the basic requirements. If they don't meet them, then we use soft email communications, thanking them for taking their time to apply and expressing interest in L'Oreal, and then we explain that their current skills and experience don't meet our basic requirements for that particular role. So over at L'Oreal, we have a thing where it's, we never say no, it's just not now. We have many brands to consider, so dispositioning doesn't always have to be such a sad story. Sometimes a candidate may not be a right fit for a brand such as Maybelline, but a perfect fit for another such as Kiehl's. So what we do is we take detailed notes on all the candidates who we have spoken to, and we build those future talent pipelines. Um, 
with nearly all those that we that don't employ. We constantly present new opportunities to our silver silver medalists. And our recruiters maintain those relationships by keeping uh, L'Oreal top of mind. So. Wow, that's fascinating, uh, Edward. Um, you know, it's a, it's a really amazing approach that you take. Um, and, you know, dispositioning really doesn't have to be, uh, you know, such a negative story for the candidate. Um, I'm sure you have situations where you've dis dispositioned a candidate that was a great fit, but the timing wasn't right, or you had uh, another high potential candidate that was maybe just a little bit better, or maybe they were more suitable for another role. But I, you know, obviously the way the approach you guys are taking is the last thing you want to do is alienate the candidate, and in which you've really invested, you know, a ton of time and money in, um, exactly. and instead of continuing to build relationships and engaging with the with those people. Um, yeah. And oh, go ahead. Sorry. Yeah. No. I mean, and I wanted to also mention that, like, right now we're also beginning to do a lot of that direct communication. So we're beginning to send out some newsletters to the candidates to share some of the stories about our company, um, brands, employees, and opportunities that the candidates would like to hear to keep them engaged. Again, with with the intent of keeping L'Oreal top of mind. And here's an example of one of the newsletters. Uh, that we recently sent out, um, sharing some stories uh, about some of our employees and business, um, and also presenting some opportunities we're currently looking for. So um, another thing that we also try to do when we disposition the candidates, if, uh, if we've met with a candidate that has gone through the interview stage, um, but unfortunately didn't quite make it, then what our recruiters do is they disposition them over the phone or in person. They have a direct call or conversation with the candidate and try to be as transparent as possible and provide insight on where they could potentially fit in the future. Um, sometimes we could also provide helpful career advice and guidance. So, for example, let's say a candidate needs to improve their skills or knowledge in a certain area. Uh, the recruiter may provide su suggestions for courses that they can take or even suggest asking their current manager for more exposure to certain areas which will give them the necessarily skill necessary skills to develop so this also helps our candidates identify ways where they can take more ownership of their career development as i said it's never a no so these are ways we can help them develop and be right for l'oreal when the time is right Wow, that is awesome. I really like that approach. Um, you know, you're going to see up on your screen here just, you know, some of the things that, that clearly Edward and L'Oreal are doing and that these are just things that you want to consider, uh, you know, with regards to dispositioning, uh, things like being timely and compassionate, you know, be a recruiter, build a relationship. Those are all things that are going to uh, really uh, help your company moving forward, help you build talent pipeline, help you build your brand. So uh, great example, uh, Edward, in, in terms of the things that you're doing. Um, that's uh, really, really impressive. I totally agree. It comes back to being a person. You want to be as genuine as possible through this process. Um, so now that you've gotten this you hire through the door, what's the first thing most companies do? Uh, you usually get them straight into the office with a stack of paperwork and documents to sign. Right, guys? Exactly. Lisa, that, that's, uh, this is really a key part of the candidate experience and it's really commonly overlooked. You know, 33% of all new hires are actively looking for a new job within their first six months at a company. 33%. And I would imagine that this really suggests that experiences and impressions that you actually form during the recruiting and hiring stages are not necessarily meeting the new hire's reality during onboarding. Imagine you're providing this awesome candidate experience. You're successful at attracting them, uh, you know, helping them learn about your brand and you're hiring good talent, but then all of a sudden your retention and employee engagement rates are low. You really need to apply the same level of high touch, thoughtful engagements and communications that you gave during the recruiting phase in the onboarding phase. Um, so, uh, let me give, let me give some examples, right? Let me give some examples of some really easy things that I've seen 
uh, a lot of the companies that I work with do. So here's, these are just some examples, like maybe a welcome email from uh, the hiring manager or pre-scheduled training and orientation meetings, uh, maybe information about what to wear, how to get to work, where to buy lunch, or maybe where the, the local gyms are. Uh, a simple invitation to lunch with the with other team members, or give the candidate an opportunity to start learning more about company values, goals, and objectives while they're preparing for their first day. Edward, is there anything in particular you're doing at L'Oreal to really extend that positive candidate experience into the hire into the new hire's first day and beyond that? Yes, yeah, David. Um, so we have a couple of programs beyond the first day orientation. Uh, that helps new hires feel supported in their transition to our company. So one of the things is the FIT program. Uh, the FIT program is our integration program for all, all new hires, where in working with their manager, they set up meetings with key partners who are instrumental in ensuring success in their new role. This could be partners with the same department or cross functional relationships to help our new hires form these relationships quickly. Um, this program is three months long and helps to set our new hires for success in learning how to navigate our organization and in knowing who to go to. Exactly. That's something we call discovery. Um, so discovery weeks, um, what it is is that we found that one of the best ways to engage with these new hires beyond the first day is through a deep company immersion. So the Discovery Week allows new hires to continue learning about the different teams and areas within L'Oreal. Um, so it's a week that is packed with presentations from the heads of each division, as well as trips to our labs and manufacturing locations. It's to get a holistic view of our product development. Um, this also encourages a deeper understanding of the corporate culture and internal collaboration and also provides visibility across different divisions that they may not have on their day-to-day -day roles. That sounds really fun. I want to go to Discovery Week at L'Oreal. <laughs> sounds it's like a blast. Nice. <laughs> Um, but I think, you know, what you're pointing to is exactly what we've been talking about this entire time. Your employer brand is who you are. And so to be able to show candidates on that first day a really authentic look at your company and immerse them in that is so valuable. And, you know, the company that is champions employer branding, Glassdoor, we have to think about how to do this for ourselves as well. And so, you know, we do things like handwritten letters uh, sent to you before your first day welcoming you aboard. And we do a new hire orientation where members from each team come and talk about the different areas of the business. You know, we make sure our CEO is involved and says hello. And, you know, some teams even decorate each other's desks on, on the first day just to say welcome. Uh, so with that, I would love to pass it over to David, who's going to take us home with some key takeaways. Awesome. Thanks, Lisa. So, uh, you know, kind of as we draw this webinar to a close, let's go ahead and focus on a few key takeaways. But let me just say, I've absolutely loved uh, Lisa hearing you and Edward uh, talk about the things that you guys are doing at Glassdoor and L'Oreal, respectively. This has been, uh, been really awesome and fun to be a part of. So let's just kind of summarize uh, four things that that maybe our audience can take away with them. So number one, uh, understanding global brand differences. Being a global well-known brand certainly doesn't mean that you, you know, that each country experiences the same brand affinity as L'Oreal was mentioning. The first step is really to kind of understand the difference, discover how your brand is perceived in different parts of the world, and then create a strategy around it. Um, I never knew L'Oreal in the US were, you know, actually experienced brand challenges as Edward described. Um, the second takeaway, customizing the application process. You know, handling 1.5 million applications per year is not an easy feat. And while you cannot attend to every single candidate, you can personalize and customize the experience so that they feel valued, relevant, and enjoy their application process with you. And as you saw with L'Oreal, depending on the job, the role, the brand, they're going to ask specific questions which allow the candidate to easily share their skills and their knowledge and then they're gonna provide them with a number of different ways to express their interest and supply a copy of their CV. Uh, they also, of course, are supporting, what, nine different languages and, and providing really specific content to each region. So they're doing really, really great stuff. 
You want to make sure that you're telling your story. Uh, people seek a greater work life as they, as people seek a greater work life balance. It's really important that you share your employer's story. Uh, clearly, Glassdoor and L'Oreal are really doing that. Uh, L'Oreal by showcasing the duality of individuals, um, and it's obvious you're appe appealing to a wider audience and and building confidence and trust with candidates. And people want to know that they can still be themselves and bring their uniqueness to work. And then lastly, we want to take a long term view on talent. Um, you know, with the never say no approach uh, to recruiting combined with the career advice you provide and insights on potential future fit. Uh, not only is L'Oreal building really strong talent pipelines, but they're protecting and enhancing their employer and consumer brand image along the way. And, you, you know, we all saw that now dispositioning doesn't always need to leave a nasty taste in the mouth of the candidate, but it can actually be a positive educational uh, journey for candidates, which which can only be a good thing. So I'm going to pass it back to our moderator, uh, Nina, but just want to say thank you for letting me participate. I've certainly had a great time uh, with Edward and Lisa, and I uh, guess we'll probably get on to, to some questions if our audience has them. Awesome. Thank you, David, Edward, and Lisa, for sharing all of that amazing information with us. Um, so at this time, we will take Q&A. So if you have not already submitted your question through the question pane, please go ahead and do so now. And for those of you that have been asking, we will be sending out a copy of the slide deck and recording. So just be on the lookout um, for that from the Glassdoor marketing team. All right, so the first question we have um, is for both, I would say, Lisa and Edward. Um, so the question is, how do you get employees to engage in sharing content or becoming brand ambassadors? Uh, I, I can hop on that. How do you get employees to engage in sharing content or becoming brand ambassadors? Well, you know, I think first and foremost, you have to have a very deep understanding of your employee sentiment. And of course, a place I would recommend to uh, check out to figure that out is Glassdoor. Um, but it's not just Glassdoor. So if you are, if you're trying to assess how satisfied your employees are at your company, check out Glassdoor, check out social media, and see if you can get a sense of what other people are saying. And from there, that will give you a lot of insight into kind of macro sentiment. And as you look throughout your organization, uh, keep an ear to the ground of opportunities to, uh, to take advantage of what's already happening. So there are voices on Glassdoor, which can give you kind of a macro perspective of what's going on. But there are individual voices as well. Um, across your organization, people who are, are champion, championing programs and, and putting in a little bit extra to, uh, to make your company great. And I think the best thing you can do is give those folks a voice. Give them a platform to share more and do more. Congratulate them and reward them for their efforts. Um, and the more you communicate to your employee base uh, across all of your offices, um, across your entire workforce that you want to hear from them, the more you'll start to get hand raisers who say they want to help, they want to hear how to brand message. So um, encourage employees to post reviews of your company on Glassdoor, but also encourage employees to share photos of the office on uh, across their social media platforms. And uh, when they do things like that, encourage them to do more, respond to the reviews as you see them, and show how engaged you are as an employer to, to keep, that, keep that train going. Yes, and um, over here at L'Oreal, I, I completely agree with Lisa. We do do that. We've asked people to go on Glassdoor and post their reviews about um, L'Oreal. Um, recently, we ended up moving to a new office location um, this past summer. So like L'Oreal corporate uh, for, for L'Oreal USA ended up creating like a Pinterest board, you know, having employees share um, their tips about the move. And then once here, we started asking um, employees to uh, share like photos on our corporate Instagram. So we do try to get our employees involved as much as possible. It's more for the overarching uh, L'Oreal USA um, and corporate you know, um, presentation on our social channels. Um, but specifically for recruitment, 
a lot of the content we do get from our employees, we do drive that from our recruiting department. So as I mentioned, like the SoundCloud uh, content, we do connect with all of our business le leads and say, you know, this is our intent, intent, this is what we want to do, and we kind of brainstorm and see what what um, opportunities kind of present themselves and also ask our employees for their input. Um, that's honestly one of the questions that we ask in our SoundCloud interviews, like what did you do Snapchat today, you know? So we do try to see where our employees are presenting their, uh, their content and hopefully we can build off of it. And that's what we've been doing. Perfect. Thank you, Lisa and Edward. Um, so the next question we have in the line is, how do you provide such a thorough level of follow-up with each applicant, especially when we have hundreds? So Edward, I think this one is probably more apt for you to take. Yes. So, so what we've done um, in order to ensure that we have that that communication continuously. Um, so within our re recruitment teams, we've aligned them with the use of our system. That's first and foremost, because Aperture does provide a lot of built-in functionality that allows us to communicate at, at a mass scale um, with those that we don't see a fit, those we want to find out more information on. We're able to even reach out to them and say someone's applying for a digital role asking them exactly what areas of digital they're interested in. Is it social media? Is it digital media? You know, um, so we do utilize the system a lot in meet, meeting those requirements. Um, and we do also have like several built-in built uh, communication steps within our workflow through Aperture. So as I mentioned before, if a if a job is filled, everyone who is not considered receives an email saying, I'm sorry, thank you for your application, but the position has been filled. Please keep us in mind for any future opportunities. Um, you know, it, and it, it does send somewhat a canned response, but we do tailor it for each zone so that uh, it sends the message that we want to relay to our candidates. I hope that answers your question. Perfect. Thank you, Edward. Um, the next question that we have is, what's the biggest difference in approaching candidates from different generations? Are you seeing any unique challenges? So, Lisa, I, I will I... direct this to you. Did you say Lisa? Fantastic. Um, next generation, so our millennials. Um, you know, I saw that recently that said 36% of the workforce will be millennials by 2022, which is coming up fast. And um, that's, that's a huge chunk of our workforce that we know has really different uh, values and emphasis than uh, generations of the past. Um, and, you know, we know from research we've on a glass door that uh, millennials tend to research companies and they want to know about those companies' values and their cultures, uh, in some cases more often than they want to hear about their 401k plans or their benefits package, uh, which is really surprising. And so when you're thinking about recruiting millennials or recruiting the next generation of candidates, um, it's important to think outside the box because what worked even 10, 20, 30 years ago is not necessarily going to work with this different kind of age in the workforce. Um, and I have a great example of a disconnect here, which is that, you know, uh, we saw a NACE survey that, that recently asked millennials um, where they hear about companies. And 65% of them said it was through friends or job boards. But then staggeringly, when you ask companies uh, what the best way to brand themselves with students is, 98% of them say on-campus fairs. So there's a real disconnect in um, what companies are doing to attract young talent and where young talent is going uh, to find to find their the company that's right for them. Awesome, thank you, Lisa. Um, so it looks like we actually are right at the hour. Um, so on behalf of everyone on the line, I wanted to thank everyone for joining us today. And again, thank you to Lisa, Edward, and David for sharing all of your wonderful information for us. Um, so with that, we'll let everyone go. Thanks for joining, and we will catch you all next time.